you go through these series of progressions, you, you start learning. It's progressive revelation. What you thought you knew changes as you keep studying the book. And you keep studying the book, and you keep studying the book. Bad theology produces poor behavior. When your theology is skewed, it's messed up, then your behavior can get a little wrong because how you think of God is really how you're going to live here on this earth. So as I'm moving through the book, I'm seeing things over the years that have really changed me. You know, and, and I've used this phrase quite often with you that God is not safe. We have a very safe society. Everything about us is safety. We have safety shoes, safety clothes. When I was a kid, you rode a bicycle without a helmet. If you wore a helmet on, on a bicycle, we called you names. Matter of fact, I ride by them now and still call them names. It's just a part of who I am. So uh, it, it, we had, you could buy a Subaru Brat when I was a young man that had two seats in the trunk, in the back, in the, in the tailgate. You know, can you, do you remember that? It had two little handles. You just hold on to them. I forgot what them handles are called, but I think I remember now. If you rode with me, I know what they were called. It was, di it was a different day. It, and, and now we've escalated. And, and we understand why we've escalated into this place. And we're trying to protect our, the human race. But the bottom line is, you have never served a safe God. You just thought you did. God is not safe. And history matters. History matters. So we're going to take some time, and we're going to go into some history. I'm going to walk you through a few things, and as we move through it, I want you to pay close attention because we're going somewhere over the next few weeks. We're going to, we're going to move into a, a several directions, but, but I think it's going to be a blessing in your life. 2 Samuel chapter 6, chapter 6, right after 5, right before 7. Are you comfortable? For those who are watching, again, it's good to... Know that there are people that are tuning in, and also that you just share this message with other people. This, this, this thought here, David, 2 Samuel 6, David, King David, the giant slayer, the psalmist of Israel, very handsome man. You know about David's life and his story. It says, David again brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 in all. He and all his men set out from Bala of Judah and to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherim that are on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart, and they brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahiah, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart, and the ark of God on it. And Ahiah was walking in front of it. David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might. They were having a tremendous worship service. And there before the Lord with songs and with harps and lyres and tambourines, sistrums and cymbals, every kind of musical instrument you can imagine. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen had stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark of God. How many know at that moment worship practice was over? You've got a man laying dead, and the ark is still, and everybody's observing what's happening. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah, and to this day that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Before we're over the next few weeks, we will be at Obed-Edom's house. In order to get there, though, we have to have a little history lesson. We've got to back up and see a few things in this, this presentation. Now, one thing I found out, and I walked in, and somebody asked me, was I demoted or promoted because I was at the door with the door greeters? And I, I first thought about it. I said, actually, I'm promoted. Be back here. Obed-Edom was a door ge uh, greeter. He was a gatekeeper. Amen. How many know uh, if you can't have a gate till you build a wall? Lord, we thank you for this service and for just stirring the pot just a little bit. We thank you for your mercies and your goodness in our life. We ask that you take this moment. Let us understand your presence in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. 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 Let me set something up here. For 20 years, the Ark of the Covenant 
the symbol of God's active intervention into the lives of his people. His presence had been laying dormant in Baal Judah. When you look at the Old Testament, you realize that the presence of God was out often in a box known as the Ark of the Covenant. Here it comes. See, they're bringing it in right. They're not putting it on a cart. We, had, we flew this in from Israel. If you believe that, well, never mind. Joseph built that. Y'all give him a hand. He did a good job with that. Inside the ark, there was Aaron's rod that budded. There were ten commandments, and there was manna. But the most important part of this ark, and we'll talk about it extensively over the next few weeks, is this part right here. I'm not pointing at the angels. I'm looking at this lid. This here is actually known, this whole lid is known as the cover or the mercy seat. The blood of Jesus, when he died on the cross, the Bible says, was sprinkled on the mercy seat of heaven. In other words, inside here are Ten Commandments. That's judgment. If I was to read all ten to you, you'd know you have broken at least one. And if you hadn't broke it yet, you broke it in your mind. Amen. Amen. So inside there is judgment. But how many know that mercy covers judgment? Amen. Come on, give God a praise for that. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. So as, I, as I'm thinking about the ark and I'm looking at it, uh, malnourished spiritually under Saul's reign, the tabernacle furnishings had been scattered. Worship had been virtually meaningless. God was safely thought of but not needed. Then came a new king, a leader, a man after God's own heart who desired to reestablish the center of worship, to renew in the people the fear of God, and to unstick them spiritually. And honestly, if you live for God long enough, you start getting stuck. You get in a rut, things get to happening. And here's the thing about God. God don't stay in a box for too long. Amen. Eventually, he's going to break out. Something is going to happen. But let's talk about some history. Everybody say history. Now, say matters. It matters. History matters. You need to study the history of Texas. When I was in Alabama, we studied Alabama history. When I look at the older I get, the more I like history. I started study, studying the Vietnam War, World War II, World War I. I started backing up the Civil War, seeing what they, because we've been so, uh, without understanding real history, you, you're left to listen to the modern-day uh, liberal uh, attitudes and things that somehow it didn't matter. History matters. Amen. All the way back, history matters. So we back up thousands of years here. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, it says, So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated. And every man, this is before David now, every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. At this time, there was a guy named Eli. Great big sucker, man. Big guy, sat on a throne. He had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Matter of fact, these boys were kind of evil. Y'all heard of preacher's kids? I'm here to tell you that not all that's true, okay? I got some great kids. But the bottom line is, Hophni and Phinehas were wicked, and they were leaders over Israel. And being leaders over Israel, they went out to fight. In the fight, Hophni and Phinehas are killed. Eli is still the leader. Then the glory, 1 Samuel chapter 4, Eli heard the outcry and asked, what is the meaning of this uproar? The man hurried over to tell who was 98 years old and whose eyes had failed so that he could not see. He told Eli, I had just come from the battle line. I fled from it this very day. Eli asked, what happened to my son? My sons, the man who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines, and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they're dead. And the ark of God, it's been captured. They've got the presence of God. When, when he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backwards off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken, and he died. For he was an old man, and he was heavy. He had led Israel for 40 years. His daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery. When she heard the news that the ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth, but was overcome by her labor pains. As she was dying, the woman, the midwife, attended her, said, Don't despair, you have given birth to a son. But she did not respond or pay any attention. She named the boy Ichabod. And many of you have heard that name before. Maybe you didn't understand where it was in Scripture. But this would have been Phinehas, his son. Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because of the capture of the ark of God and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband. She said, The glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. Here's the thing. You, you can't stand, you can't handle an angry God. 
And when they took God, literally, if you were to understand this, they took God out of Israel and they brought him to the Philistines. When they brought him in, they put him in a temple known as Dagon's temple. Now, some have seen Dagon as a, a reptile head, a giant idol, if you would, in which the Philistines worship. So they bring the ark in. And by the way, if you study the ark, this is the size of the ark. It wasn't some massive uh, a box, it was this size, two foot by three foot, two and a half by three and a half foot, something just like this. So as you see it, they brought the ark in and they set it before Dagon. After the Philistines had captured the ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod when they carried the ark into Dagon's temple and they set it beside Dagon. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon falling on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. But the following Mormon, morning, Mormon, the following Mormons, when they rose, there was Dagon falling on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. What was this symbolic of? That there is no power in idols. There's nothing greater than God. Amen. He's not safe. You don't put him around your idols. He don't get along good with them. Amen. He don't like them at all. And here the idols are on the face. His arms are snapped. He has no power. He has no legs. He has no move. Now that should have been a aha moment. Right? You ever had one of those aha moments? When something just hits you and you go, man, you know, surely the, Phil the, the Israelites are right. There's something about that box. That thing's more volatile than a nuclear weapon. That thing right there will destroy. And go fix it and walk you through it and prove it. So they, they take the ark. I, I call this little segment a pain in the butt. 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 7. When the people of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said the ark of, the, of God of Israel must not stay here with us because his hand is heavy on us and, and, and on Dagon our God. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and asked him, What shall we do with the ark of, of the God of Israel? They answered, How the ark of God moved to Gath. Well, what's Gath all about? Remember Gath? Now, this, now, Goliath is probably, he's probably six, seven years old now. See, this is during Eli's rule. Saul's not king yet, which means that Goliath has not entered the fray, and David hadn't fought him yet. So Goliath's probably just a little bitty guy, guy in the first grade that's seven foot tall. All right? So, so they move it to Gath. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and asked them, what shall we do? Have the ark moved to Gath. So they moved the ark of God of Israel. But after they moved it, the Lord's hand was against that city, throwing it into a great panic. He afflicted the people of the city, both young and old, with an outbreak of tumors. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. As the ark of God was entering Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They brought the ark of, of God of Israel around to us to kill us and our people. Now, guys, I'm not going to go into a lot of history here because I know we've got some folk here that might be a little bothered by this. But that word tumor has to do with a backside sore. Y'all with me? All right. First Samuel 6, 7. Now then, get a new cart ready with two cows that have calved and have never been yoked. Hitch the cows to the cart. They try to figure out how, what, to, what are we going to do with God? How are we going to take And the world is still wondering, what are we going to do with God? I was listening to you share there, David, and I was saying to myself, heaven, why, I hate having to beg people to go to heaven. Why Why you got to beg people to want to be with God for eternity and to see their relatives again? Why you got to do that? My friend, I would rather be with God in the right standing than against God in the wrong standing. And at this moment, they're taking it and they're trying to figure out what are we going to do with God. So they take this, this, uh, these cows, they hook it up that, that had calves, and they said, take the ark of the Lord and put it on the cart. And in the chest, put in on gold objects you are sending back to him as a guilt offering and send it, to his, send it on his way. Now, they, as they did that, they put, they put five golden rats in the, in the ark, and they put five tumors, golden tumors. Now, I don't know who posed for that, but they had to figure out what they looked like, and they shoved them inside the ark, and I'm sure they lifted the lid and just kind of threw them in because now the ark is coming up the road, and you've heard the old song, the ark is coming up the road, and there's acceleration, excitement, and as the ark is coming up the road on a cart, it was a Philistine idea to bring the ark up the road on a cart. It was not God's idea. God never told them that. In the history, you learn that if something has a, has a, has a, a, a catch on it, evidently a pole should go there. 
How many say common sense? Amen. Some of us think serving God is common sense. It's just common sense to do it. So here we find that, that they're bringing the ark up the road, and it gets to a fork in the road, and then the cows start going toward Israel. At that time, I believe the Philistines even started worshiping God. Something began, they were excited. But God struck down some of the inhabitants. Look at this, 1 Samuel 6, 19, of Beth Shemesh, putting 70 of them to death. These are Israelites because they looked into the ark of the Lord, and the people mourned because of the heavy blow the Lord had dealt them. In other words, and you've, you've seen the movie, The Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's the same thing. That's where they got it from. That some of them lifted it up. And listen, we ain't never going to be big enough to look in the face of an angry God. You ain't never going to get to the place where you can win a staring contest with him. Amen. And when they looked inside that ark, 70 of them were killed. Then they took the ark and they moved it aside and said it. it was, nobody wanted to deal with it again. Now watch this. We'll move quick. Then the rule of King Saul. The death of Goliath. Then David versus Saul. Uh, um, actually, Saul versus David. He, Saul's chasing David everywhere. Da Saul's actually his father-in-law. It's tough to have a father-in-law that wants to kill you. Hey, Dad. Hey, man. Uh, da David becomes king. 20 years has passed. We've got 20 years between the death of Goliath and now David is king. Then we find 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 18. Then the Spirit came on Amasa, king, uh, chief of the 30, and he said, we are, we are yours. Do you remember the, the, the mighty men that came to David in the cave? When they came there, these were men that were able to sling a, a stone and, and, and hit a hair, left hand or right hand, bows. I mean, these were tremendous men. When they got there to David, they said to him, we are yours, David. We are with you, son of Jesse. Success to you and success to those who help you, for God will help you. So David received them and made them leaders of his raiding bands. And now you've got this tremendous, uh, 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 a positive, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a tidal wave moving in David's favor. And David's saying, there's one thing missing. There's one thing missing. It's God. We need his presence Back in our place. Where is this ark that I have heard about? So the scripture says, David conferred with each of his officers, the commanders of thousands, the commanders of hundreds. And then he said to the whole Israel uh, nation, if it seems good to you and if it's the will of the Lord our God, let us send word far and wide to the rest of our people throughout the territories of Israel and also to the priests and the Levites who are with them in their towns and the pasture lands to come and join us. Let us bring the ark of our God back to us for we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. In other words, the whole reign of Saul, we never ask, where is God's presence? Where is that mighty ark? Where is this thing that caused such that made Dagon fall on his face twice? Where is the ark at? We need the ark of God. Let us bring the ark of God back. The whole assembly agreed to do this because it seemed right to all the people. Amen. And then they bring him in. We just read the scripture as they're bringing him in on the wheels of haste. As priests, they should have known. Again, by history, 1 Samuel 6 and 7, they should have known to carry it on their shoulders. Common sense says it was in the details. It's in the rings and the poles. We're made, listen, when you look, and I look at you and you look at me, we were made to praise. We were made. If God didn't make us to praise, we'd be worms. I'd be preaching like this. And somebody had to put the mic in here with their mouth. But God gave us these hands. He gave us these feet. He gave us the ability to dance, to worship, to open our mouths, to celebrate Him. And sometimes we hold back. Oh, no, 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 no. Man, when the ark is coming up the road, somebody give God some praise. Yeah. Something going on here. Now, listen. The ark on the cart was a Philistine idea. Amen. When, when they got the new cart ready with two cows that have calved and have never been yoked, they hitched the cows to the cart and they took them there. By the way, when they got there, before the 70 looked in there, they destroyed the, the cart, burned it, sacrificed the, the, the cows on top of it. They were celebrating until, again, the party was over when somebody looked in it. How, how do you handle God? Who's in whose hands? Are we trying to hold God and keep him in our hands? Or do we forget that we're in his hands? New Testament says for that, that no one can take you out of the hand of God. So the issue is simple. Are you trying to hold on to God with your man-made ideas? Well, you know, I'm going to work my way into heaven. I'm going to do good. I'm going to give to this one. I'm going to get in this good boy, good girl club. I'm going to, I'm going to do all this. Or do you realize it's the grace of God and you put your hand in his hand and say, God, you hold me. Because really, that's what I need right now. I need to be in your hand. 
I need to make sure that's where I'm at because this, this is what happened here. Uh, Samuel, 2 Samuel 6, the ox stumbled, the cart lurches, the Ark of the Covenant totters, slides, and threatens to tumble to the ground. And there he was. Now, I, I, I know that I feel like I'm justifying God in the area of Uzzah. And God don't need justifying. But there was a word in chapter 6. It says, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him dead. So it hit me. What did he do that was irreverent? You, do you know irreverent when you see it? To me, pants that are hanging below the buttocks is irreverent. It's just irreverent. It's not necessary. Uh, uh, there, there are things, uh, not opening a door for a young lady coming in is irreverent. It's, it's, it's just, if you see her coming through, it, somebody with packages, you're not helping, that's irreverent. There, there's, it's, 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 it's wrong to do. So whatever he did calls God, God saw it. And he, I don't know if he was like goofing off. Wrong time to be goofing off. The ark is the stumbles. He reaches out like somehow he was greater than God to hold up the ark, and boom, he's dead. And what happens is God didn't give but just one word, irreverent. He didn't get up and say, well, let me just tell you what he did. He kind of leaves a little speculation there, doesn't he? What he does is he put the fear of God in everybody. Everybody started backing up. I mean, boom, it stopped right there. They were coming up the road. It stops. David looks back. It's over again. We got a problem. Us it teaches us at great personal cost a valuable lesson. First, God's safety is not our business. I have never been concerned that somebody's going to beat my God. I've never been concerned that any other religion is greater than my God. I've never been bothered by the fact that somebody comes to me and tells me of their religion, tells me of their God, and I look at them and I look at the book and I say, did your God send his son to die for your sins? Amen. Did he have a propitiation? Is there mercy that covers over judgment? Or is all you want to preach is judgment to me and tell me how I need to act when I don't have the, the ability to do it without the grace and mercy of God? Are you telling me that your God's greater than my God? I don't have to, listen, God's big enough to take care of himself. Our role on this planet is not to keep the Almighty from mishap or embarrassment. He's too big to catch. Second, be careful of trying to catch God in the hands of your former ideas. For God's hand may come into play. Hebrews 10.31 still reminds us in the New Testament, it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And I'm here to tell you, we are living in a day of mercy. I thank God for grace. I thank God for covering us. I thank God for his presence. But there's still something that's just unsafe about God. There's still, I, I do, uh, and, and I'll hear people say, well, you think God is judging us? No, I think the blood covered us. But God forgive us if we ever get to the place to take this for granted over and over and over again. Amen. To remind ourselves, this day of keeping God safe, March, it's over with. I, I'm ready for God to break out. I am. I'm ready for God to break out. I'm ready to see God do some crazy stuff. I, I, it ain't just the miracles. I want to see the miracles. I want to see God do some crazy stuff. I want to see a shift in our nation. I want to see people coming back toward God like they never had before. I want to see this horizontal thing we got going connected with the vertical. I, listen, I was going to mention this tonight. Good, good marriages, but they, they're not good because of this. They're good because of this. Yeah. Amen. If you don't have a vertical relationship in this marriage right here, this is not going to last. It's not going to be good. you got to keep God in the middle of this. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Amen. It's got to happen. This, this thought, this thought of, a, of a bent over, a little tired of irreverent, uh, 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 to intervene, hair sprouting from his ears, running about the nose, winking at our little pranks and sins. That's a nice thought. But God is not always nice. I know he is always good, but he's not always nice. He ain't always safe. He's a consuming fire. He may care about a sparrow, but he's not a doting dad. God's main business is not ensuring that you get a parking space up close somewhere at Saltgrass so you can get in and get something to eat early. Amen. He, you know, there's something about him. In our lives, Uzzah, Uzzah was a casualty of friendly fire, of bad theology. He meant, whose fault? First, it had to be Uzzah's. They put it on a new card. Dave didn't give them details. He just said, go get the ark. Bring it to me. 
They saw the Philistines rolling on a cart, and they put it on a cart. So then they went back, and they began to study, and the whole assembly agreed. Everybody agreed it was, it was right to bring the ark of, but then they began to study. And let me just say this. Bad theology produces poor behavior. When you get involved in this church, the little country church, in the next, in the next few weeks on the 9th, of, we're going to have a stable in the saddle class. And if you've not signed up for this, sign up for it. It's just a, a real brief teaching on a morning to give you a little firm foundation. But the bottom line is all of you came in here with a different theology. Everybody came. You were Lutheran, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, uh, uh, Charismaniac. Uh, you, 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 were, uh, you, were, you were part of uh, the ladder splatter. You, 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 you were involved in Baptist churches of, of 100 different denominations. You know, you, and everybody had a different flavor. And, and what happens is, is our theology. You know, I look at Patsy and Donald. They've been with me 30 years. You know, theology, my theology, my, my belief in the very beginning, the blood plus nothing has never changed. It was the blood that was poured on the mercy seat that saved us, rescued us, took care of us. But as I moved through life, all of a sudden I wasn't as mean anymore. <laughs> Judgmental, sacrilegious, self-righteous. I started realizing that people are people. Amen. People need God. And in our way of presenting it, we've done such a poor job doing it. You know, I still, sister, I'm still dealing with Damon's funeral in my head. 51 years old. I, I, don't, I, I don't do good with that. And yet, here you are in church because of that. Terry, where's Terry? Terry, I see you. I did your husband's funeral. Here you are in church. You know, I, I know that all things work together for good to them that love God. And God has a way for us to see each other later in life so we live the best we can here. The Scripture says, it was because you, the Levites, did not bring it up. This is history. Everybody say, history matters. You did not bring it up the first time that the Lord our God broke out in anger against us. We did not inquire of him about how to do it in the prescribed way. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves in order to bring the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Levites carried the ark of God and the poles on their shoulders as Moses had commanded in accordance with the word of the Lord. Hear it. As leaders... We've innocently allowed people to be casualties of bad theology. We've taught them things. I know when I get to, get, to the, get to heaven, I'm going to be responsible for what I've preached and what I've said. But I can tell you this. You can never go wrong pursuing the presence of God. Going after his presence. Wanting to see him more. Hang out with him more. Get to know him more. That's what he wants. In the New Testament, he, he later said, I just want to be your God and let you be my people. Amen. I, I'm, not here going, I'm not going to knock you down because you rolled me in. That day's over. Amen. I've done, done that once. But I promise you, there's coming a day when God does come back to this earth. The scripture says Jesus will come back riding on a horse, on the side of the horse, be Lord of Lords, King of Kings. He'll be dressed in white, and, and, and he'll take vengeance on those who do not love him or love his father. Now, again, oh, I want to be on horseback with him. I don't know how all this is going to go down. I don't have a, a, an eschatology degree. I don't have, well, like the guy in San Antonio, what's his name? Uh, it's got the big chart all the way across the top. And, uh, yeah, John Hagee, I, I was in the same college where he had taught. And, and you know, and he's got, this is going to happen. The vows are going to be open. The bowls are going to happen here. And this is going to go down. And then, boom, we're going to go up. And then, boom, this is going to come down. I don't know none of that. Every time I've studied through that, it confuses me a little bit more. I'm a pre, uh, I'm praying for pre. I'm praying that Jesus comes before the tribulation, but I'm preparing for post in case he don't. I'm a pan millennialist. I believe it all pan out in the end. I hadn't, I hadn't got a firm handle on, on all this stuff going down at the end. I, I hear, read books and catch people. And I go, that's a good thought. That's cute. That's this, that, and the other. But the bottom line is you've got to live for God today. You got to stay with him now. You got to stay near his presence today. So that so they bring the thing in. Had David searched the scriptures and inquired of God, Uzzah would not have died. What we believe matters. It, you, just this this idea. We, we have so many nebulous ideas of belief and and how how we think. Your beliefs affect your behavior. How you believe God, what you see about God, all of those things affect how you love people, forgive people how you help and, and care for people, all of those things have to do with that. You know, balance is important. I fear God, but I'm not afraid of him. I said I fear him, but I'm not afraid of him. I don't go to bed at night quaking, but I fear him. I know that he's a butt kicker and a name taker. I realize that. And the last thing I want is some of them tumors that they put inside. I don't want none of that. Amen. I don't want rats running all around my house. Don't need that. 
You, know, you have to admit it. Us is dead. The ark is at Obed Edom's house, and you got egg on your face, David. What are you going to do? Second Samuel six. Now King David was told, "The Lord has blessed the household of Obed Edom." Three months they studied. We'll give it ten minutes. Three months they studied. Three months they went back in the Old Testament. Three months they got, they stared at that box and they said, "What are we going?" To? One thing is, I ain't looking in it. Another thing is, let's take it to Obed Edom's house. I bet Obed Edom looked at his wife and said, Baby, while you dust it, don't touch the box. Don't dust the box. Just work around it. And we'll talk about his blessings and all the good things that come from having the presence of God later. But they went down to Obed's house. So David went down and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. Then those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps. G- give me just one strum. Give me something with some noise. They took, he, he, would, he would take the ark. Get the ark, get the ark, get the ark, get the ark. Come on, come on, come on. Somebody give, 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 me, give me, I need two more people. Come on, get up here. Get up here, ark carrier. Amen. Give me, give me. I need one more person. Come on, Joseph. Come on, Joseph. Amen. Come on, give me four. Give me four. So here, here they go. Come on, come on, come on, come on. We ain't got, we ain't got three months. Pick it up. Put it on their shoulders. Put it on their shoulders. Behind me, behind me, stay behind me. There you go. <laughs> Watch. So the scripture says that David, whoops, let me find it here. There it is. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and fatted calf. You know what this is called? Being careful. One, two, three, four, five, six. Slaughter. Give me, hey, hey, pay attention, puppy. Strum. Just give me a strum. Thank you. Then the music stopped. It sacrificed the bulls. David looked back. Good, good. We're good in the back. We good. Hey, this is working. Six more steps. One, two, three, four. Five, six, Maris. Kill a cow. Sacrifice, look back. Looking good. Looking good in the back. All right. It's all good. Six more steps. One, two, three, four, five, six. Look back. Kill a cow. Turn around. Okay, y'all got to swing now. No, no, you ain't got to swing. Just, just reverse. There you go. Now, this is the crazy part. David wearing a linen ephod danced before the Lord with all his might. Come on, follow me a little bit. One, two, three, four, five, six. While he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and sounds of trumpets. We don't have a trumpet. We've got a guitar. Come on, next scripture. Go to the next scripture. Is there another one? Is that it? Okay. All right. Y'all, y'all walk a square off so y'all can be behind me. This, this here hit me. He danced and danced and danced and danced and danced and danced. danced. Y'all follow me? This is what gets me. Y'all want to square up? Y'all want to square up? Come back toward me. That way you can see what I'm doing here. Y'all square it up. Here's what gets me. Uzzah touches this thing. He's dead from an irreverent act. David... Dances till his clothes are falling off. He's swinging it, having fun. His wife, Micah, sees him coming up the road and says, you, you're just ir- irreverent. You're wrong. How dare you dance like that in front of them girls? That's what she says. She's jealous. This is the same girl 20 years ago that when David killed Goliath, Saul said, I'll give you my, my daughter. Remember her? And then and David said, I can't take nothing from you for free. And Saul said, well, I know a way to, to kill you. This was his setup. I won't kill you. Go get a hundred foreskins for me from Philistines. A hundred of them. David comes back with two hundred of them. That's a bad boy. <laughs> you tell me how he got them. I don't want to know. <laughs> I just want to know who was toting that sack through the desert. That's the only one I want to know. <laughs> so now... This is his wife, Micah, and she's mad at him. And David said, you think this is bad? 
I'll even be more indignant than this. There's a humility that has to come over us when the presence of God gets on us to the point where I don't care what you think about me, I'm going to lift my hands. I don't care if you bother if you bother by my shout, I'm going to keep on shouting. If you bother by my praise, I'm going to keep on praising. I know you've got to stay real dignified because you're a business this or, or you that in school or that this is the other. You know, you come out of a, a theology that said that God is nervous. And if you shout, don't make him nervous. I didn't come from a theology. I wasn't raised in church. But I knew this much about it. When something was good, you shouted. When food tastes good, you make a little noise. When the drink is well, you say something. When, when worship's going on, you got to express yourself. You can set it down. Stand with me. It's not that heavy, is it? <laughs> Just think if I'd have read that, Joseph and it said it was it was twenty foot long and thirty foot high. Man, when I read that, I thought we can, we we can build that, we can make that happen. Oh, oh, David had a desire for the presence of God. I I've seen wildfire, I've seen crazy, I've seen stupid David in church, I've seen. But I, I have. I'm not talking David. I'm just saying that David knows what I'm talking about because he's come through that. He's been in a lot of churches too. Uh, but to have the authentic presence of God, to have a life-changing presence, to have one that comes in and says, if i got to sacrifice every six steps, I'll do it. I just want to get the presence of God back to my house. There was a man weeping among the ceremony there. His name was Obed-Edom. Because his house was blessed for three months. He didn't want to see that ark leave. There's something about following after it. Being teachable. A willingness to be corrected. And if need, change your theology. Well, Pastor, this is what my grandpa believed. My grandma and granddaddy and daddy and mama. I ain't telling you they're wrong. But I'm telling you, some of our theology has kept us stuck. It's kept us in places where we, we're afraid to win. You, when you get to heaven, don't you want to meet people that you led to Jesus here on this earth? Or you at least sowed seed into their life? Or you at least watered it? Amen. So God could bring the increase. Don't you want to be a part? I, I know you got jobs. I know you work. you got careers. you got family. I know all that. But somewhere, God has to be first. Then there's second. And then our church life and work life and all that's down the line. Right. But God, I want to put you first. That's what David did. Six steps. And, and as a man after God's own heart, he had such a degree of humility to abandon pride. I'm not talking about dancing. You know, I, threw, I know I did that. But I, I'm thinking to myself, when you read it, David, David just was abandoned. Every thought of a pride of a king. I study kings. I mean, I'm fascinated with kings and queens in England and all of that stuff. I'm fascinated with it. And kings are so proper. And to know that a king that come off a field that took care of sheep, that killed a Goliath, that lived in caves, they had to teach him how to be kingly. Forget that. That's my king. He's king of kings. Lord of lords. He just danced in front of him. He just turned it loose. History matters, my friend. For some of you, you're starting your history right now. You're just getting started. You're just, you're going to lay a foundation. I'm a first generation believer. My kids are going to be second generation. You're just getting started. So what daddy believed is, is very important. What David did was very important. So understanding where you stand with God is going to bring protection in your life. Us might have died, but Obed Edom was blessed, and everybody else was when that ark came up. And second, direction. God starts giving you direction. With your eyes closed for a moment, where do you stand? In the hands of a holy God? Or are you trying to keep God in your hands? Trying to manipulate Him with your prayers, with pity, sorrow? Or have you just got to a place where, God, I'm going to trust you? I'm just going to trust you. 
I'm going to believe you. I just want you to come and hang out in my house. The scripture calls us the tabernacles of God. That's who we are. These vessels, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's no longer in a box in Jerusalem somewhere. He's in you. If you say, Pastor, I'm not for sure that in my own life. I'm not for sure God is in me. Let's make it sure today. Put your hand up if you're not sure. Let me pray for you right where you stand. Thank you, sir. Just put your hand up. Just right where you're at. You're not sure. Thank you. Anyone else? Those watching online, you can do the same thing. Let's pray this together. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Into this tabernacle. Dwell in me. Be my God. I'll be your people. I ask your blessing, your favor, your protection, and your direction. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, give God praise. Well, how about a little history lesson, huh? How many say I learned a little something today? Did, did you know what? I, I mean, I'm going through it again. I've known, I've known the story of David. I've preached on David so much in my life. And I went back through it and I went, I didn't see that there. <laughs> I even questioned David. David had the same thought I did. And he said, and we both were wrong. We had to go back and study the history. Had to go back and see it again. Amen. I love this book. Amen. Be seated for a brief moment as our servant leaders are coming up. Again, guys, if you're new and you've not taken this class, it will be held here. It will be held here on the 9th of March. Get you a book and sign up. It's no cost to it. We will be feeding you lunch, and you'll have a, a brief breakfast that morning, I'm sure, at the Pony Express. But we'll, we'll have this here. So sign up in the back. And, David, you've got other things. Well, but, uh, Sister Diane, mention your, what you've got going on. Did you do that? Thank you, Ms. Diane. Good to have you back. Y'all give her a hand. If you need to tie their offer and envelope, honor the king. Amen. Lift your hand. Got quite a few announcements. David's going to go over here. Got a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, let me just say this. David, Joseph, several of us are going out of town next week. We're going to leave Sunday week. We're going to Florida. Many of you know we've been helping a church there. And uh, Liz and Larry just got back from Panama City, went and visited the guy's church. Uh, it's devastating, the whole thing is. And uh, so I'm taking about 10 or 12 guys, and we're going to go down for a week and uh, going to uh, build fences, demolish, do whatever we can, mainly to encourage him. So if you'd like to support that trip, you're welcome. To just, you know, throw a little extra in, say for Florida, something of that nature. We'll use it for gas and food. Again, we've got to take care of the guys. It's, this is on us to go down and make this happen. So uh, we'll talk about it a little more as the week goes along. But I appreciate your support. All right, today we have Lift Ladies Bible Study, uh, Miss Diane. Um, they're going to be in the back immediately following service. So ladies, if you want to uh, get involved and just study the Word, not just study the Word, but be be a part. You get you get a chance, you know, uh, Miss Marie runs them. There's a lot of things going on in the church, and the whole reason we do that is to connect. you got to find a place to connect, otherwise it's very easy very easy to get disconnected. If you never planted, you can be uprooted easily. Amen. Uh, tonight we have Valentine's Banquet. Uh, that's going to be with uh, Ken Holloway uh, and Blaine. And they're going to be at, what is that, Country Chic, right? Country Chic in, in Crosby. Yeah, yeah, our pastor says Country Chic. <laughs> <laughs> Bless him. <laughs> March 1st, TLCC Ladies Ministry. Uh, Friday, March the 1st. Save the date for a fun ladies night. And this is going to be you guys. Uh, Miss Marie, if you guys have any questions, anything in the back? Not yet. Okay, so just see Miss Marie if you do have a question. Uh, March the 2nd, uh, Daddy Daughter Dance. Uh, Saturday, March the 2nd. Happily Ever After Daddy's Daughter Dance in, at the New Kenny Cafeteria. See Miss Marley. And Randa. There you go. She's going to throw her in there. Is it? 
<laughs> Got it. Uh, March the 3rd, 5th, and 6th, we are going to be having our spring conference. Uh, that will be Sunday night, Crosby campus. Um, it starts off. It's going to be the only difference uh, in our normal week. Uh, we have March the 9th. He wasn't lying. We do have a lot of stuff going on. March the 9th, we got sit, uh, which is stable in the saddle. Guys, this, when I... When I first came to this church, I was like, okay, you know, you, you never know what a pastor really believes. So you're always kind of listening in the sermons and you're kind of, okay, what do you really, and, and this will tell you exactly what our pastor believes. It will let you know whether you agree with him or not, but the, the good thing about it is he uses Bible. Listen, he's not just giving you opinion, and that's what I wanted to see. I, I, I hear a lot of people state facts, but they're just from their perspective facts. Let me hear the Bible, and that's what he does the whole time. He just gives you Bible and, and what he believes, why he believes, and he gives you Scripture to back it up. Amen? Um, and then March the 10th, daylight saving time. Uh, spring forward, don't be late to church. <laughs> Amen? Today we're believing God for jobs and better jobs, more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. 